top 10 micronutrients for healthy aging. Um, and in the, uh, I'll provide some resources um, in, a, in a moment, but these are our top 10. Um, some of the qualities of these top 10 are one, that they play a big role in some of that health span markers in terms of immune function, disease prevention. So we're not just talking about deficiencies, but at the same time, all, a lot of these top 10 nutrients are also ones that are at high risk for shortfalls, especially as we get older. Right now, um, vitamin uh, D and calcium are really the only micronutrients that have an age-related, uh, 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 older adult-related change. And we strongly believe that many of these nutrients also potentially should have a, a, a different, uh, an a, or are age essential, um, basically, and may need um, a little bit more attention um, be, because of that. Um, in our top 10, we've also indicated ones that uh, especially need to be looked at uh, more closely in terms of your intake if, if you are, are uh, an older adult. So what are some of the consequences of not getting um, these, these key micronutrients? So I'm going to talk about a couple different domains, um, especially in the immune function and around mitochondrial function as well. So we know that aging is associated with a compromised immune function. Um, and uh, the, the quality of that uh, immune function change is, is, is multifactorial. Um, there are some aspects of the immune system that are dampened, um, so the, they're not working as well. Uh, so you're more susceptible to infectious disease, vaccine efficacy is, is impaired as well, but there's some aspects of the immune system that are actually overactive. Um, and this results in chronic inflammation. And chronic inflammation, as I'd mentioned before, is kind of a, a common underpinning to many of these chronic diseases and can be a precursor to many of these um, diseases. So limiting um, this chronic inflammation is, is, is definitely a, a key factor in terms of improving um, health span. So again, when you think about our immune system, um, there are lots of different parts of the immune system. Um, I have here on this slide kind of three general broad areas um, that relate to both kind of acute defense and then longer term event, um, defenses as well. So there are basic barrier defenses. So these are things um, like the mucous membranes in our lungs, um, our GI tract um, as, as well, and changes in gut permeability or changes in your lung epithelia will cause um, increased entry, of, for example, of viruses, bact bacteria. So maintaining those barriers is extremely important. And then there are also specific components of the immune system that are often, that are cellular based. Um, there's our general defense that's related to our innate immunity um, that uh, use a, a your white blood cells uh, kind of broadly. And these are, again, are a class of cells. And then there's the acquired immunity that are more specific of, of defenses. So these are things like cells that produce our antibodies um, or cells that create factors that help um, engulf or destroy um, invading uh, pathogens as well. Um, the bottom line is our nutrients, and especially these micronutrients, play roles in all three of those domains. Um, and there are different micronutrients that play a role um, as well. So there may not be a single micronutrient um, that, that plays a role. So this is a, um, a figure from a recent paper that uh, myself and some other colleagues at the Institute and um, other partner universities uh, put together talking about um, micronutrients and, and its role in immune system. And I know this is very complicated, but the bottom line, it is complicated. Uh, and it's multifactorial in terms of different systems from barrier function, um, B cell, T cell function, um, that uh, various micronutrients work together to uh, optimize uh, our immune system. And again, uh, have that uh, resilient so making sure that you have adequate amounts of these micronutrients um, is really critical to maintaining a robust uh, immune system. And I'm going to give you some examples um, from some of my work. Um, so I do a lot of work with zinc. Um, zinc is a well-known uh, factor um, in terms of uh, plays a role um, in the immune system. We also know that, again, as we get older, um, there is complementary to the changes in our immunity 
um, changes in our zinc status as well. So the prevalence of zinc uh, deficiency is um, potentially higher in older adults because it's a bit of a double whammy. One, older adults do tend to decrease their zinc intake along with their protein intake. Um, zinc often follows protein um, intake. But on top of that, even if you are getting um, X amount of zinc, um, there's increasing evidence that the ability for you to absorb and distribute that zinc um, as you get older is also compromised. So again, you're pretty, um, uh, as you get older, you're much more susceptible to not getting enough zinc. Um, zinc is also important um, in all three of these areas. Um, some of the work that we've done, so this is an animal model that we can show that um, older um, animals, so in this case, these are two month old, which are like a young adult versus 20 month old mice, uh, which uh, is more like a 65, 70 year old. And we can see that even though we're giving them um, a purify a, a diet that we think is optimal uh, and has everything it needs, these older animals, even though they're eating the perfect diet, look like they're zinc deficient. They, they're, they're, they're very low. On top of that, we also see that older animals have significant amount of this chronic inflammation. So this is interleukin-6, which is a marker of inflammation. Um, and uh, as they get older, they have much more underlying inflammation. What's interesting is if we supplement these uh, these mice uh, with extra zinc, uh, we can bring their zinc levels back to that of young. And importantly, we can also um, pretty well obliterate uh, the chronic inflammation as well. Um, so again, this is some early work that, uh, that we've done at the Institute to really help hopefully establish the need for potentially more zinc um, as we get older to help limit this. Um, we've also done some other work uh, with uh, multivitamins. Um, so in, the, in this case, this one um, also contains zinc, but it also contains a whole uh, host of um, vitamins um, and minerals as well. Uh, and after uh, several months of supplementation, we can see that um, in an older adult population that we're able to uh, decrease incidence of respiratory, respiratory uh, disorder. Uh, 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 problems um, as, as well. Um, we also have done a lot of work with mitochondrial function. So one mitochondria, so this is the powerhouse of our cell, um, is known to also decline as we get older as well. And that has significant consequences on various cellular functions um, in terms of not only your bioenergetics, um, but also oxidant stress pathways. It can lead to chronic inflammation. Um, it can lead to um, controlled cell death of, of specific cells as well. And we also know that our micronutrients are highly critical in terms of maintaining our mitochondria function. So uh, some of my colleagues at the Institute um, also did a multivitamin study to look at mitochondrial function. Um, and the first thing that we noticed, again, um, we recruited healthy um, individuals um, to this uh, clinical trial. And one of the first things that we noticed is we asked for people who kind of self-reported as being healthy, trying to do everything right. Um, and when we measured um, their micronutrient intake, both from diet and blood biomarkers, notice how many of them, so for vitamin D, for example, 100% of them were not consuming enough vitamin D. Um, so even in a, pop, a, a apparent healthy population, the prevalence of these shortfalls were pretty pervasive. And this was really uh, something that was quite surprising to us, um, given uh, the, the population that we tried to recruit. Um, when we gave these individuals supplements for a six month period, so this is just a heat map. Um, on the left are uh, the group that got the multivitamins, and then on the right are the ones that are um, that got a placebo. You can see there's more green um, on the left versus the right, uh, which is not surprising that we were able to change the blood levels of micronutrients um, with the, with the supplement that we didn't see in the placebo. But other thing to note is that even though these are all the multivitamins that were in that supplement, we don't see changes across the board um, in everything, whether that means it takes longer. Um, but another thing that I wanted to point out is that a lot of these nutrients 
have problems in terms of a, a valid biomarker. Um, zinc, the one I study, is a great example of, of the, the blood measure that your clinician will do is actually not a great biomarker for, for, for detecting deficiency as well. So there's a lot of um, questions um, and, and challenges in terms of really trying to understand um, the impact of these micronutrients on, on health as well. Um, in terms of mitochondrial function, though, we also were able to show um, that uh, individuals in the multivitamin group were uh, protected against mitochondrial function loss. Um, that, uh, so in the placebo group, we saw a rate of change um, in terms of loss of mitochondrial function, um, and we were able to maintain that mitochondrial function um, in individuals that took the, the supplement. Um, outside the LPI, there's been some new exciting data, um, especially in the last year or so, that have also really looked at the power of multivitamins and cognitive function as well. Um, so this is a group um, uh, that uh, did this study. It's called the COSMO study. Um, they looked at both cocoflavonoid supplementation and multivitamins in um, cog cognitive outcomes. So again, uh, these are um, pat uh, patients, um, individuals that uh, are older adults. They're showing some signs in terms of dementia, cognitive decline, um, which is um, not uncommon even in a healthy population. Um, and just taking this multivitamin um, seemed to have uh, quite a bit of, of power um, in terms of improving cognitive outcomes. Um, and again, it's not anything crazy that's happening here. It's simply a, a multivitamin that these individuals are taking. So this is some new exciting data that's come out in the last year. I believe some more is um, coming out um, as well um, in the coming year for other health span markers as well. So um, we're keeping our eye on that. But again, the power of use just simply taking a multivitamin um, in many domains of our health span um, appears to be a, a benefit. Um, so before we open up for some questions, just wanted to provide a, a, um, some resources. So this is an example of the top 10 brochure that I mentioned. This is what it looks like. It's laid out this way. Um, it lists the top 10. Uh, it also talks about foods that you find it in, um, kind of targeting mechanisms. And then we have this kind of little guide um, with icons that kind of talks about, you know, if you're interested in cognitive health versus immune health, um, there are icons um, next to each of those nutrients and, and, uh, um, and where uh, that nutrient may, may play. Um, there, this is a QR code um, and the, the web link to the LPI website where the top 10 documents are. There's, uh, I just showed you the, a general brochure. There's also a health professionals brochure um, that has a little bit higher level of information on it. Um, and then we have two, three ancillary brochures focusing on bone health, uh, brain health, um, and, and, and immune health as well. Um, so check that out. Uh, we definitely, again, are inspired by Dr. Pauling. This is one of the quotes that I love to, to, to highlight in terms of you know, the power of nutrition uh, for our health. Um, and it's really kind of the driving force behind what, a, what myself and many of the researchers at the Institute do.